Well, welcome to my first webinar at uh, Poly Hill. I'm in a fit of whimsy. I changed the title of my webinar to Ephemerally Yours, Spring Wildflowers of Kentucky. Um, as Liz said, I'm Emily. I am a new assistant uh, curator and assistant director here at Poly Hill. Um, been here six months. I'm originally from Minnesota. And for the last four years, I've been living in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, I worked at the University of Kentucky Arboretum and managed an 80 acre native plant collection that was a lot of the plants were wild collected. Um, so I really, I actually learned that the Appalachian Mountains had a lot of diversity and plant life from colleagues here at Poly Hill nine years ago when I was a curatorial intern. And so when I had the opportunity to move there for a job, I thought, well, you know, that I, I think I'll learn a lot. And I really did become uh, enthralled with the natural beauty of Kentucky and specifically loved the spring, um, as you can see from this picture. So my favorite time was spring. Spring basically came as early as February in Kentucky. Um, this is a photo of me, I think, finding some trillium or something in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and today I'm really going to kind of take you, it's almost like a show and tell of some of my favorite uh, springtime flowers in Kentucky, as well as some of their Martha's Vineyard and Poly Hill Arboretum sort of counterpoints or just other, other plants that I like. So uh, it was a really fun presentation to make. Um, and uh, I'll start sharing more about spring ephemerals. So I, I knew, you know, I've known the, the definition of an ephemeral for a while. It's lasting for, a, or the adjective ephemeral, lasting for a very short time. But it wasn't until I moved to Kentucky that I learned that it could also be a noun. Uh, it's a spring ephemeral is a plant that grows flowers and dies within, you know, maybe a few days or a week. It's basically something that's around for not very long. This whole process happens when, mostly when, the leaves of um, you know, deciduous trees are not fully leafed out yet. So it's a strategy. It's you know, between uh, snow melt and hard freezes and then leaf out is when these plants have the opportunity to um, grow flower, be pollinated, set seed, disperse seed, and then die. So I am most familiar with plants in Kentucky in these two regions. So they're called the bluegrass region. So Lexington is in the inner bluegrass here. Um, so a lot of exploring around these, um, this area. And then in the Appalachian Plateau, Cumberland Mountain area. So Appalachian Mountains. So that's where I'll be focusing in plants in Kentucky. And then also I have down here, we're on Martha's Vineyard. Um, I'll be talking about plants that are native to Martha's Vineyard, maybe some that are introduced. And then uh, Polly Hill is right here in West Tisbury. So spring ephemerals thrive in rich undisturbed woodlands um, in a variety of soil conditions. These photos here are photos that were taken in the bluegrass region. Bluegrass region is known for calcareous soils, highly phosphatic soils, really productive soil, um, but more basic and uh, limestone kind of areas. One of my favorite spots is the Kentucky River Palisades. Um, it's an area that has a lot of rich um, like streams, tributaries, limestone cliffs and the, the rocks there, the limestone is actually, Ordovician limestone, it's 450 million years old. So there's some really cool plant life that thrives in, these, in this region. One of my favorite areas are Lower Howard's Creek, which is where an old mill was. Um, this is a springtime walk where you can't really see it, but just bluebells all over the place. Um, and then Flora Cliff Nature Preserve. Uh, where there's a uh, really amazing uh, uh, formation called a tufa, which is calcium carbonate uh, rock that's formed from basically the precipitation of ambient uh, water. The um, Appalachian Mountains, however, have a, a slightly different soil composition. They are um, mountains, sandstone, so more acidic, sandy soil. Uh, maybe more similar to what we have in Martha's Vineyard, 
um, some of the plants I won't be talking about, but heuchera here, coral bells, and uh, wild columbine you may be familiar with, just growing in the wild. And these photos here taken, especially this one, taken in April. So you can see that the it's very moist, it's very productive. There's a lot of um, evergreen azaleas. The trees weren't even leafed out yet. So this is all like coniferous um, and uh, yeah, evergreen rhododendrons. Some of my favorite areas in, in that area are in the uh, Appalachian Plateau is the Red River Gorge geological area. So these are actually hemlock trees on a, um, a rock along a stream where there are amazing spring ephemerals. Uh, plants growing on top of these large rock deposits and then uh, caves and uh, cliffs in on Pine Mountain in southern southeastern Kentucky. So I probably should have titled my talk something like this, like spring, uh, introduction to spring, ephemerals and wildflowers of Kentucky, Martha's Vineyard, and the Polyhola Arboretum. So I'm going to be talking about all those things. And um, I wanted to note that I have these kind of cues at on each slide um, of, of specific plants. So uh, Kentucky, or KY is Kentucky, Martha's Vineyard, and Polyhola Arboretum. So when you're looking at the slide, you can see if it, where it occurs um, from what I'm talking about. And I thought a little bit about how to structure this talk, you know, it's like maybe by bloom time or by specific sites or regions, but there was a lot of overlap with um, some of the, the plants. So as like a true um, plant nerd, I'm, I've arranged it by plant families. <laughs> um, so it'll be fun. And we are going to start actually coincidentally with the earliest blooming um, spring ephemeral that I found in Kentucky. Um, and I'll be going through about 40, so uh, we'll see if we get through all of them. But the first is actually, it has a very appropriate name. It's called the Harbinger of Spring. And you can see from these photos, it's very small, um, between one and four inches tall. This is just like a, a maple leaf. Uh, it's in the carrot family, and it's called a salt and pepper plant because it has these white petals, but then you can see these, these are the anthers, so the pollen producing uh, parts of the plant are this kind of brown to like purple, purple color. Uh, the first spring ephemeral that I, I saw, I think this came out in February. I, I actually remember it very well. It was February 2019. <laughs> um, so another very early, an earlier blooming spring ephemeral is the early saxifrage, as the name would suggest, Macranthes virginiensis. This is in the saxifrage family. Something that's, so they love growing in these sort of rocky um, ledges and have one of the, the things I think is really interesting about this plant. So you can see the hairs along the stem here. And those hairs actually secrete kind of a sticky substance. They're glandular. And the adaptation, they, it's actually to stop insects from climbing up the stalk to get to the to pollinate the flowers. Because what they want is they want um, airborne insects that can then take that pollen uh, farther. So I, I found that to be really interesting. They sort of have these almost succulent leaves and they can be very small. A plant that you may be familiar with is the heart-leafed foam flower. So this is a plant that is in a horticultural um, trade. We actually have some that we've bought in for our plant sale, which would be at the end of May, um, Tiarella cordifolia. This um, I found most often in the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, this particular uh, clump right here was along a roadside next to a tree um, in the Red River Gorge. And this would be the sort of habitat um, or around the sort of habitat that they also grow in. So again, moist, rich woodlands. They, the name Tiarella, if you can think Tiara, it means crown. They're very like dainty flowers um, and uh, have a high tannin content, content. So they're actually used somewhat for medicinal purposes. So they in Kentucky and we have at Poly Hill. And then this next plant, which is one of my favorites, 
is um, bishop's cap or mitre wart, uh, Metella defila. So an interesting note about this common name, uh, the seed pods of this plant apparently look like a bishop's cap, which is also called a mitre. Uh, so for all you who like crossword puzzles, maybe that will come in handy someday. <laughs> Um, the, the leaves or the, the petals of this, um, flower are incredibly, uh, dissected and fringed. So you can see how tiny this is. It's actually very hard to photograph without like putting your hand behind it. Um, hard to focus on it, especially because I'm not like a, photog a photographer, but in this photo at the bottom here, you can see that that's my thumb and my finger. And that's just like how small those tiny flowers are. Um, and these, it only has two leaves and they're about a quarter of the way up the stem. So next I'm gonna talk about Trillium and I'm excited about it. I also just the first time I saw a Trillium that was like not quite in bloom, I thought, oh, that looks like a fringed lizard. But like what I actually thought first was, oh, that looks like the lizard with the frills or the uh, dinosaur with the frills from Jurassic Park. Um, so I don't know if you agree with me, but maybe you do. Um, <laughs> there are 12 trilliums native to Kentucky. I've, I've only have four right here, but because um, there's a lot and they're actually pretty hard to identify, especially from just photographs. So um, they, the one thing I wanted to note about the trilliums that are in Kentucky are uh, there's two different kinds. There's pedicillate and there's sessile. So sessile means that it's like directly attached. So if you look at these photos at the bottom, these, these are the flowers. Um, they're directly attached to the stem and the leaves or the bracts right there. So there's no stalk. Whereas pedicillate, the stalk of a flower is called a pedicel. And you can't really see it in these pictures above, but you'll notice this looks like it's above. It's not quite attached. It's definitely, it's got a stalk on the end of it. So there's two different ways to sort of categorize um, trillions in Kentucky. And one thing, one that I will go into a little bit more in depth is one that's very, um, it's rare in Kentucky. It's actually endangered in Kentucky. There's only, I think, two or three sites. Um, it's the snow trillium. And this, it's called snow trillium. It's, it's, it's another sort of harbinger of spring. It comes out in March, um, sometimes when there's still snow on the ground. It's very diminutive, small, delicate, um, and this, I, I was lucky enough to have friends who managed a preserve called um, at Shaker Village, which is in uh, kind of the, the bluegrass region of Kentucky. And we had this really epic day where they said, oh, it'll just be like a creek crossing and then we'll walk up a hill. But we actually crocked, crossed a creek about 13 times, I swear, like boots in the water, walked up this hill bushwhacking it, but then got to this population of snow trillium and we actually did a count um, of what they were, what how many there, there were, and it was just uh, really fun. And it's fun to be involved in that kind of conservation work. So plants in the, um, Trilliums used to be in the lily family, actually. So kind of transitioning to a few plants that are in the lily family. Um, the first are trout lilies. So there's yellow trout lily here pictured and white trout lily, Erythronium americanum, which is the yellow and albidum, which is white. And something I find really interesting. So you'll first notice when trout lilies come out the leaves, there's these very, they're modeled, um, and kind of like pretty easy to spot. And then they'll send up these flowers with these really beautiful, we call these um, recurved petals. They kind of go, go backwards and then very conspicuous anthers. So this is where the pollen is and it hangs down. It's very um, obvious. Uh, something I find really interesting is that these are also called dog tooth violets to some, which I'd never really heard before. And it's interesting because like later I'll talk about birdfoot violet, which is actually a violet. It's called that because uh, the corms uh, underneath the soil actually look like dog teeth and they're really hard and white. 
and apparently these are also known as phosphorus sinks. So they retrieve phosphorus from the soil and then make it available in leaves, which then herbivores like to eat, like deer. So at Poly Hill, we keep them enclosed in uh, what we call Polly's playpen, which is an area that has basically deer fencing and lots of delicate plants. So the fawn lily, which is native to uh, the Pacific Northwest, uh, Western United States, uh, is something that we have at Poly Hill that you can see in the playpen. Um, we have a cultivar, cultivar called Pink Beauty, but you can um, note kind of the similarities of the anthers, the um, mottled leaves, although this is a little bit wavier. And one of my favorite plants in Kentucky um, was is the spotted fairy bells, they're spotted mandarin. So the, it has creamy um, or cream colored uh, petals that have these like purple splotches on them. Um, they're sort of nodding. It's also called nodding mandarin. So this flower kind of nods down. Um, parallelly uh, veinated leaves, kind of a hairy stem uh, found in, um, again, rich, more like calcareous woodlands, although I believe this one was from uh, a wildflower weekend that the Kentucky Native Plant Society put on in the Appalachian Mountain, kind of Red River Gorge area. So another plant that uh, used to be in the lily family is large flowered bellwort, uh, Uvularia grandiflora. If you can believe it, this is the, so this is the flower right here. It has these twisting petals that almost look like leaves. They're yellow, but they can be kind of like a green turning to yellow, overlapping, um, really striking. And on Martha's Vineyard, we don't actually have Uvularia grandiflora. We have something called wild oats, the Uvularia sessilifolia, which has um, the, the, the petal, Petals are slightly less twisted um, and it's a smaller stature plant. But if you want to remember this, the scientific name, uvularia, um, if you can imagine the uvula, which is at the back of your throat, uh, is that, that like fleshy bit. Um, that's what this is partially named after. Um, Another favorite of mine that we actually had at the Arboretum and in calcareous in woodlands across the bluegrass region is the wild hyacinth, Camassia soloides, um, a, a plant that doesn't bloom for very long, um, but is, I love how, you know, in this picture here, you can see the different bloom stages. So this up here hasn't quite opened yet, fully blooming, and then these are already gone past. And at Poly Hill, we have Camassia like Delaniae, which is the um, large camas and that is native to the uh, Pacific Northwest, again, west coast of uh, North America. And I just took this picture today. So they're about to bloom. If you're on the island, um, I would say in a few days, they'll be popping. So a plant that many of you may be familiar with is bloodroot, Sanguinaria canadensis. Um, bloodroot referring to the, um, the rhizome, which actually oozes a red kind of sap. These, if you know this plant, are you know, very beautiful flowers, but highly um, fragile. So if it's windy or if there's a rain and they just started, they just bloomed. Uh, the petals might be gone within a day, but they still have these very cool um, leaves that are underneath. And we do have bloodroot at Poly Hill. Um, it is the, a cultivar that's a double flowered version. So it's actually quite impressive. And it bloomed, you know, maybe I took this picture last week and it's already, the petals are starting to, to fall off, but it was, it was great while it lasted. Another plant that is, that could be familiar in maybe a different version, if you may have bleeding hearts in your, your garden, the very magenta heart-shaped flowers. 
uh, but this is a, a native version that in Kentucky, the Dicentra cucularia and Dicentra canadensis, Dutchman's breeches or and squirrel corn. So these are two different plants. Um, this one on the left here is Dutchman's breeches. And you can tell it's called that because it looks like little pantaloons on a clothesline. <laughs> And then squirrel corn here is actually named that because the underground um, structure has these little yellow bubbles that or bulblets that look like corn. But you can see this angle here uh, is a lot different. So that's how in the field I can tell that this would be squirrel, squirrel corn and this is Dutchman's breeches. Also, these leaves are much more highly dissected um, and like thinner than the, the other. A favorite of mine, uh, I feel like every, all of these are favorites. I guess I, I, this is like a favorites collection, but um, I, I would go to this specific place called Tom Doran Nature Preserve and they had this Solandine poppy, Styliforum diphylum, which was, it can be sort of a columnar plant, so it can get kind of taller, but they have these very deep yellow flowers, and there was just this like hillside that was covered in this poppy, so when you got, went at the right time of year, it was just yellow everywhere, um, and I love the, the fuzzy little buds here, but this is something that we have at Poly Hill near the, kind of near the bathrooms and the visitor center, um, but also are, are attempting to grow from seed right now, so it's germinating, hopefully will germinate in the greenhouse. And I just wanna make sure you don't confuse this with another plant that I like much less, which is called lesser celandine. It may not look, it, it looks, the, the leaves look quite different, um, but this plant, Ficaria verna, it's in the buttercup family, which you may, it looks sort of like a buttercup. And, it is highly invasive. It invades stream sides, um, really woodland areas. It has three different modes of vegetation, of course. So it can, uh, yeah, reproduce via rhizomes. So kind of spreading out. It has these little bulbs that also can like wash away on the water and deposit somewhere else and grow a new plant. And it also reproduces via seed. So something that I struggled with in Kentucky in one certain area of the arboretum, but also I've seen on Martha's Vineyard uh, in the West Chop area along the stream side. Now, this plant here, the, the next couple of plants I'm going to talk about are in this family down here is a Berberidaceae. So that's the barberry family. And if you think about a barberry, you think like a shrub maybe that is spiky, <laughs> potentially invasive. Um, and this is that family and that those plants are also in this family, but there's a couple pretty cool spring um, ephemerals that are also in the Berberidaceae. So the twin leaf, um, Jeffersonia diphylla, it actually is named after Je Thomas Jefferson, is called twin leaf, as you can see here, because it has these kind of two parts, two leaves. They look like lungs. Um, and then this almost perfect, flower that it's unfortunately it flowers for about a day like if you catch it when it's flowering you can feel pretty good about yourself <laughs> um but i think still like the just the saturation of color of the foliage the shape of the leaves um with or without the flowers just really really beautiful and then also in this family is the May apple. It's another one you may be familiar with, one that we have at Poly Hill, one that is listed as being in Martha's Vineyard, but more as introduced, so not native. native. And then in Kentucky, um, this plant looks, you know, when it's, you can't really see it here, but when it's coming, you can kind of see it pushing up and then they look sort of like little umbrellas. They, the leaves open up and then this single solitary flower appears. Um, kind of at the base of these, these two leaves. And that flower will eventually, you know, once it's pollinated, turn into a berry with, that has many seeds in it, but it looks like a small lemon. So this kind of like big berry at the base, um, which is, um, yeah, found in, again, in, like most of these, found in moist uh, woodlands. 
Uh, and this is something that we have at Poly Hill, the shredded umbrella plant, which is reminiscent to me of May apple, but is actually in the aster family. <laughs> so um, very different and not native to the United States. I think it's uh, from Japan, but has like this very like, um, comes up in a similar way, similarly spreading leaves uh, and really, um, really cool. You can find this one under the new the bottle brush buckeye near the uh, visitor center bathrooms. So I have some so a couple, I think like the next four plants can be a little they're, they're very similar to each other in certain ways. Um, and they're the, so this is again in the buttercup family. Uh, this first one, my mom actually sent me a picture of the other day um, from Minnesota and to ID. And um, it's called sharp lobed or sharp lobed hepatica. I believe all of these are sharp lobed hepatica. Um, and I think this name might have changed, but hepatica, cutiloba, and Americana. So sharp leaved, you can see here, this is a leaf uh, and it has kind of a sharp point to it. This is purple because it actually, the leaves stay on through the winter. They'll have old leaves that will then be replaced by like new shiny green leaves. Um, and what's cool about this is the diversity of colors that it has. So it's, it can be from white to pink to lavender to more of like this blue color, a uh, really fun uh, and pretty widespread plant. Another very widespread plant, uh, Thelictrum phalloctroides, Ruinenemy. Uh, something, the distinguishing feature of this, which we'll like kind of go through when we look up against the other plants we'll be looking at, um, is this sort of shallowly lobed leaf here, leaf. Um, but another plant that is widespread has showy flowers that range from white to pink, although um, more petalous. We have one at Poly Hill that is a cultivar, clearly. This is another sort of double flowered form, but you can still see that leaf shape that holds there. And on Martha's Vineyard, I've been noticing around, um, walking around the trails, the, I've been seeing anemone quinquefolia, which is the wood anemone. Uh, again, kind of a less petals. The leaf is a little different, but you can see where it might look kind of similar. Um, and then you're going to the false ruin enemy. So we have ruin enemy, wood enemy, and then the false ruin enemy, which is an entirely different genus, um, but still has a, kind of a similar leaf shape, but a little bit different. Um, and this one is native to uh, Kentucky. So one of my um, favorite finds at this Nature Preserve, Tom Dorman Nature Preserve that's on the Kentucky River was a patch of golden seal, Hydrastis canadensis. Now golden seal has been known to be poached because it has um, strong medicinal value. People make tinctures and teas out of it. Um, I just love it because of how you know delicate the flowers are and then also the sort of the leaf, it will expand more once it is done flowering, but when it's flowering, it's kind of this like wrinkled, very like yellow green leaf. Um, so the next um, plant I'll be talking about is Mertensia virginica. This is another one that you'll probably be familiar with. It's grown and sold in horticulture industry. And for good reason, um, these plants, these next few plants are in the Boraginaceae family, the Borag family. And one of the distinguishing features of that family is that it has um, the inflorescence or this group of flowers is, has a specific shape to it, sort of um, flat topped. And they tend to flower first from the middle and then to, they'll open up from the outside and they'll kind of give it this flat topped shape. So, the leaves when it comes up is are, are they come up pretty early you can see there's still um leaf litter from last year on the ground uh they come up this like purple green color and then eventually turning to to the bright green 
uh, buds are pink, but then when they actually, the flowers open up, they're blue. And they just like have spec a spectacular show, like a carpet of, of they can really colonize a space. So uh, this was like bluebells for as long, as far as the eye could see. Um, and we're going to be planting 40 in the play, around 40 in the playpen this year which I'm pretty excited about. So we'll be able to see them next year. We'll be planting them among May apples and some other, some of the fawn lilies, that sort of thing. An another spreader, Facelia bipinitipida, uh, the fern leaf Facelia. I just love this plant because it's got these um, kind of deep purple uh, flowers with a white center. Bipinitipida, meaning, you, you know, you can see this, uh, the leaf down here is uh, pinnate twice twice pinnate is what we call that. So it, it's just how the leaf is um, arranged. And this is a uh, plant that, you know, I said that I'd kind of diverge from the um, Kentucky if spring ephemerals sort of area. The hoary pecoon Lithospermum canescens is actually found in limestone, like rocky, glade type areas so there it was almost it was open grown um a fun find where it has these kind of sturdy yellow flowers hairy um very hairy stem but uh the name pecoon actually is a native american name for plants that uh have a red or yellow dye that can be used for red or yellow dye. So bloodroot is also another alternative common name to that is pecoon. You may be very familiar with Jack in the Pulpit, Arisima triphylum. So this one in the middle is the native plant. This, uh, these plants are in the arum family. Uh, a lot of wetland plants are in this family and sometimes when they're characteristic can be, they have this thing right here, it's called a spadix, and that's like the flower, this fleshy um, structure that has flowers on it. And then it's cut, will be covered by what we call a spathe, which is like a leafy appendage that, um, that covers it. And we have, so on Martha's Vineyard and in Kentucky, this, the Arisima triphylum is native. This is a seed, you can see the seed pods or, or like kind of fleshy fruits of the um, Jack in the Pulpit. And then this one to the uh, right here is Arisima Sakokienum, which is the Japanese Jack in the Pulpit. And that's something that's blooming right now uh, near the visitor center at Poly Hill. And they really do look like, especially when they were unfurling, it was like the leaves were arms and they looked like people. <laughs> uh, and clearly I'm excited about this plant. So this is one that is, not native to Kentucky. Um, a, and I, I told a friend about this who's in Kentucky and she was really excited because she'd never seen one, uh, the skunk cabbage, Simplocarpus uh, fetidus. And you can see again here, here's the inflorescence, the, the, or the spadix, these little yellow bits are actually, um, I think the anthers. And then um, that covering, that leafy appendage covering it, there's two things that are really cool about skunk cabbage. It's called skunk cabbage because it smells. Um, I haven't noticed it like just walking by it, but like when you crush the leaves, it has a bad odor. The, um, also the color of this, uh, this uh, part, the, the flowers is supposed to mimic and the smell is supposed to also mimic carrion or decomposing flesh. So it'll be um, attract things, pollinators that are attracted to the, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, and then the second thing that I find really interesting about this is, um, uh, I'm gonna get the word right here. They are, they, they do thermogenesis. So that means that they actually um, uh, have the ability to meta metabolically generate heat. So in the, in the winter, the, they can um, grow when there's still snow on the ground and they'll actually like melt the snow around them. Uh, it can sometimes be like 20 degrees warmer around where those, the, the flowers and the, the plant actually is. Uh, growing, grows in long stream sides 
uh, and in marshy areas, seeps, bogs, that sort of thing. I was looking through my photos and I was like, I, I should do some violets. And I was like, I can't, I, I don't know if I can identify some of these violets from just this photo. It's, it can be difficult. And so I took the two that are um, the most identifiable. So this one from Kentucky, the long spurred violet, Viola ristrata, and it's actually one that I love. It has this like long spur that's like a nectar spur. Um, so whenever I see that, it's like, I know what it is. And then on Martha's Vineyard, the, the counterpoint to that is um, the bird foot violet, which the leaves look kind of like bird's feet, hence the common name. I'd be remiss if I didn't um, actually talk about the plants that are on the slide, on my like introductory slide, uh, the blue-eyed Mary. So this is actually an annual plant, uh, has very striking uh, tube colors on the, or bicolored flowers. And they just, this specific picture is from the Raven Run Nature Sanctuary in uh, Kentucky. And it's in this area called the Flower Bowl, where just every year, um, a lot of blue-eyed Marys come up, you know, annual plants, but then they reseed. And um, also delphinium, uh, the native delphinium. So I would also be remiss if I didn't put some kind of orchid on here. You know, I only had so much time and I didn't, you know, see as many orchids in Kentucky as maybe I wanted to, and some are in very protected areas. But, um, and this, this actually here is from the Arboretum. You can tell that's, um, it's, it's more like in a horticultural area, but it is native to uh, Kentucky, the Kentucky Lady Slipper and the Pink Lady Slipper, which were just amazing things to see. Um, so the orchid family, they, they generally have, um, the, the flowers are highly specialized. So they are only symmetrical. Um, they're, they're, bio, they're bilaterally symmetrical, so symmetrical in one way. The petal, this petal at the bottom here is called a labellum. So it's uh, highly modified, I would say. And um, really the, the name Cypripedium refers to, it, it's Greek for um, Venus and then a shoe. So you can see where you get pink lady slipper or lady slipper from that name as the common name. But grow in acidic mixed coniferous forests, uh, acidic, yeah. So the lady slippers that I saw in Kentucky, I saw in, um, the Appalachian Plateau. And this is just a, this is like an almost unfurling, just the leaves, uh, which actually I love. Another deviation from flowers is uh, the bear coroner, American Cancer root, Canopolis americanus. Um, this plant is parasitic and it does not photosynthesize. So you can see it's um, like a yellow color almost. And these are the, the flowers, these tubular flowers. Um, it's parasitic on basically two different kinds of trees. So oaks and beech. This is clearly probably an oak. It does create kind of feeds off of the, the roots and it um, will create kind of knobbly bits on the, the actual roots. And this family in general is like a, a family full of non-photosynthetic plants that parasitize um, on other things. We're getting to, I think, our last couple plants. Um, one that I wanted to mention is wild ginger, Asarum canadense. This is in the Aristolachiaceae family, um, also known as the birthwort family. It is... Another plant that uh, is this color, or the, the flower is this color to attract beetles, ants, insects that would normally be attracted to carrion. Um, I love like lifting up the leaves of ginger and just finding this tiny little 
um, the tiny flower below this is a small shell but you can see the they're small um, but they um, something that's interesting so that seeds when they they're pollinated and then they get seeds they actually have this like oily seed coat um, it's almost or like like a food that's that covers the seed so it's sort of fleshy and ants are attracted to it they'll take that seed and they'll bring it back to their ant nest and they'll actually eat around the seed itself and then deposit the seed and that's how they reproduce this is not the ginger that we uh, you know eat or buy in the grocery store but it has been um, used I think as a spice um, but maybe poisonous so not recommended um, and I, I put this picture here because uh, this is a woolly pipe vine as isotrema macrophylla uh, this is also in that family this is something we have at Polly Hill uh, right outside the visitor center all the vines that are along the around the arbor and they have little kind of similar I can see the similarities in that flower. I think they look like little saxophones. Um, one of my favorite flowers that I didn't even, I, I had forgotten grew in um, Martha's Vineyard is the trailing arbutus. This is in the Heath family. And this is something that I found uh, in on ledges in Kentucky, like in, in the Appalachian Mountain area. Um, they have these wonderful uh, kind of evergreen leaves. Um, and then these dainty, so these are very small, this is a very small fly, if you can imagine, um, flowers that, um, this is the state flower of Massachusetts, actually, and I see it almost every time I go hiking, there's, I'll find some little patches of it, and was really excited to see it flowering every day. And then I think this might be the last slide, and I saved the best for last, um, this is not something that is native to Kentucky, although known by like many of my Kentucky botanist friends, a Coney Bell's Shortia glassifolia. So this um, is a plant that is, is, well, it's a rare flower in the South Southern Appalachians. It's in Alabama, um, or no, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia, but mostly in one area in South Carolina. Uh, it has these like evergreen leaves that are sort of multicolored, um, but it, and, and for, found in moist stream sides. Um, I think my favorite thing about this flower, it's very short, but for how small or short it is, I think the flowers are about an inch. Um, they have these very frilled petals, the, the way that they, um, sort of lift up, uh, I caught them at a couple of different stages of opening here when they're first starting to open, halfway open, and then like these fully formed um, flowers. Uh, they're, they're just like happy plants. <laughs> um, and these are found in the playpen. Again, another like pretty delicate plant that, um, yeah, we don't want, we don't want deer to eat. So I think with just looking at time, I'm going to end there. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed watch, seeing all of my favorite, uh, favorite spring ephemerals and not so ephemeral uh, plants that are in Kentucky and beyond. And I guess now I can take any questions that you may have. Hi, thank you so much, Emily. That was wonderful. All those photos were so beautiful. And I was just like soaking in all of the plant knowledge and trying to retain as much of it as I could. So you can definitely tell that you're the curator. So that was awesome. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll do a few minutes of questions. Um, one question that I had just on the top of my head as I was watching that is, are there any um, spring wildflowers that are native to Kentucky that we don't currently grow at Polly Hill that you would want to grow here or that would be suitable for our growing conditions? 
Yeah, I'm not sure if I know the collection well enough to totally answer that. Cause like my first thoughts, I'm like thinking about acidic soil. Like, I mean, I would love to grow the spotted mandarin that I had shown that one with the purple splotchy um, flowers. I also, um, we do like some of the things we have that are cultivars like the Tiarella cordifolia. It'd be really cool to go to Kentucky and actually um, collect that from seed and bring it back in like a wild collected kind of um, aspect and put that in the playpen. But I also, um, let's see, I'm gonna look at, think about some of the things that I had seen that would be, I mean, some of them like trilliums are hard to propagate. <laughs> too like spring ephemerals can be kind of difficult to propagate um right yeah. so that aspect but well and I know we have a late a much later spring here too so that probably affects everything as well but, yeah um, cool so well I guess for a long time <laughs> yeah yeah and I yeah so I guess stay tuned um to see what you might end up adding to the collections um so we have another question um what what well, okay this is sort of a series of questions <laughs> um <laughs> what blooms next i suppose out of what you were talking about um favorites which i know you mentioned a lot of favorites so maybe if you have one or two very favorites um right. yeah and then there's kind of another part to the question but if you can answer those yeah, first <laughs> I, I see them uh, <laughs> yeah. so my favorite is the coney bells uh, which is the Shortia glassifolia, one of the, the last one I talked about. And that actually is available in the nursery trade. I think some of these, like you'll have to go to either native plant nurseries or like, you know, not just Lowe's and not just like your typical nursery, but maybe one that's a little bit more specialized. Um, so things like bluebells, some trillium, um, and you can buy some plants on online um but as in terms of what's flowering next here the great the cool thing about um this being my first season is that I don't know what's going to come up <laughs> and so every day I walk around right. and I'm like oh my gosh I had no idea that that was there um <laughs> which is kind of fun um but I would say um some other favorites. I do love the wild hyacinth, large camas. Um, that's a favorite. And uh, Dutchman's breeches, twin leaf. I don't know if twin leaf is, I know that in Kentucky we had some native plant nurseries that did sell twin leaf, but I don't know what it would be like in Maryland. All right. Well, that's, I think you pretty much covered that the answers to the, that question. So, um, and then we also had a comment about um, the trailing arbutus smelling like gardenia. Have you heard of that? That's interesting. Um, and they said it's, but it's, it's hard to get one near the flower, I suppose, to smell it. Oh, yeah, I don't know because I haven't heard of that. And I don't know because I, I, I haven't gotten, although to take a picture, you do have to get pretty close, but I, I haven't gotten my nose up to it yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't either. So I guess I'll have to see that as well. Um, okay, and then I guess kind of a logistical question, how and when will the recording be available? Um, it will be on our YouTube channel. So yeah, if you'd like to watch it back and, um, take some notes on some of the botany information that Emily shared, or if you want to share it with people, it'll be on our YouTube channel, which is just Polly Hill Arboretum, and it'll be posted in a few weeks. Um, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, and if you subscribe, then you'll get updates when new videos are posted. Um, okay, and then, oh, and Lizbeth, who, thank you for joining Lizbeth, um, said she has a Jeffersonia in her garden and we could grow this. So maybe we'll see if that's added to the collections. Um, so, all right. 
Well, thank you so much everyone for joining. Um, and thank you, Emily, that was really great and really fun to see all your pictures um, of spring ephemerals that you saw in Kentucky. And then already a lot of pictures for not being here for very long of um, plants that we have here. So um, that was really great. So yeah, thank you everyone. Um, and I hope you all have a good night. Yep. Thanks. All right. Bye, everyone.